Hey everyone, welcome. Um, so we're going to start and do the first lecture for COM 105 this summer, and I'm about to start a timer because uh, I'm going to try really hard to do this in about 15 minutes. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction video, normally if you were in an in-person class, I would be able to fill the space a lot more with videos and things like that, but I figure if I can just kind of go through this really quickly, then you can pause where you need to pause or rewind things, and that way those of you who want to go a little faster can get it fast. Um, so okay, let me go ahead and share my screen here so you can see lovely PowerPoints. And remember, um, the PowerPoints are available on eCampus 2 if you would like to do this without my voice or my face or whatever. Okay, so um, this is probably a horrible way to begin, but I'm just going to say it. I think this is the worst lecture of the entire semester. <laughs> um, so we're starting off on a good foot. No, it's not a bad lecture. I just think it's kind of boring. But the whole point of this is to sort of contextualize um, where uh, media fits into a larger study of communication. Um, and this dude right here, who looks a little blurry on the screen, his name is Jim Makrovsky, and he was the um, sort of like one of the founders of my department at WVU. Um, and he has this lovely definition of communication, which is stimulating meaning in the minds of others using both verbal and nonverbal messages. And that's like a really important point I want to emphasize, which is a lot of people think communication, oh, right, it's like people talking to each other true uh, but it's also nonverbal things it has to do with um, what we're wearing and the way that we say things and how fast we talk and things like that um, all of these things are the ways that we uh, interpret meaning um, in what people are trying to communicate with us um, he's dead now but um, he was a very important person um, this is part of the boring part of all this, but it's like sort of necessary. If you take any other communication classes while you're at WVU, and I hope you will, usually every department is going to start with uh, this, the Shannon Weaver communication model. Um, and it just shows you how communication works. There's a sender, they send a message. Can you see my little thing here. They send a message, it goes to a receiver, the receiver decodes that message. Um, there's also like some feedback, you know, so then there's, so messages are sort of flying every which way. It is really simple. And to be fair, it's been criticized as being kind of simple, but it's like sort of an important basis to sort of understand what we're going to be doing in this class, um, which is we're talking about how that message gets through the channels. Um, us people, the media people, we always assume that um, whatever message you're sending it matters what you send it through. It matters if you're face-to-face. -face. It matters if you're on a Zoom call or whatever. Uh, it matters if you're talking on the phone. It matters if you're sending it through text. Media, The medium is another way of saying the channel and plural of media. Uh, plur media is the plural of medium. So anyway, th this is just a long way of saying we're focusing on the channel here. Um, here's another picture of that. You know, I mean, the only thing I really want you to sort of understand is just the basic communication. Messages get sent from sender to receiver, then back to sender. And again, the the the, the important piece of that for this, um, for, for the purposes of this class is that sort of centerpiece, what, it, what the message is traveling through, the channel. Um, okay. Um, here's some examples, though, is like how we can think about that in terms of like the media. So like, you know, um, like, okay, yeah, interpersonal people, the people who like to study interpersonal communication would be studying that face to face contact context my people uh we would be interested in studying for instance i love i mean i know i'm not very hip but this was interesting to me maybe you're all loser fruit fans but um apparently loser fruit is a very uh well well received twitch personality and loser fruit um you know is a person who communicates on the media through the media through twitch that would be the channel or the platform in this uh, specific situation and then you know there's some guy who really enjoys watching loser fruit and he would be the receiver in this model um and of course he's trying to 
decode whatever loser fruit is doing. Um, and then I was like, yeah, you know, actually like the way that feedback even works in a media communication model is a little different too. Cause like the feedback that loser fruit is getting is she's getting like the comments because on this particular platform, Twitch, if, if you haven't used it right, like part of the um, part of the thing is being able to sort of see all of the audience like streaming comments coming in. Um, so it's just, again, trying to show you how like that simple model can sort of be applied in different media contexts. Oh, there we go again, channel, yay. Okay, um, this is just what I said. So, you know, whenever we talk about the media, I know that most people think, oh, the media, oh, the evil, like liberal bias and Fox News and they, they, my husband says this all the time and my husband is a journalist he's always like you can't go around telling people that you're a media psychologist because they think you just study the news because when people say the media like they think the news but really what the media is is a study of any sort of channel any sort of medium it's just plural for that um, and we haven't come up with a better way <laughs> I don't know why the news sort of capitalized on it but it is um, what it is so now you know uh, um Okay, so that was a really quick sort of um, crash course into where uh, media communication fits into the general communication model. Now, I want to talk about this term uh, mass communication, which, uh, you know, I believe technically, even the way that this class was put in the catalog, it's called Introduction to Mass Media or something. So it's important we address it. Um, but essentially, remember, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe you don't remember because you weren't there. But a long time ago, um, you know, when media started to become more of a thing, right? We've always had, we've had newspapers for a very long time. We've even had, oh, we've had things like, you know, the Bible around for a long time. You know, books are media too. Um, we have people texting. Um, and um, the those like traditional types of media that people tend to think about, television, radio, these broadcast forms of media were considered mass communication because it was normally a way to send a message to a mass, which like is basically a large group of people. Some people would advise saying, oh, it's like anything over 50 is a mass. I mean, there's no hard and fast rules, but if 50 floats your boat, go for it. I think it's just more of the idea that it's very different from on the other side of the slide, interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication is different because we normally think about it as like a one-on-one -on -one or one-to-two sort of communication situation. It's not a broadcasting situation. When I teach this class um, as a large lecture to 300 people, uh, yeah, I would actually consider that mass communication. Um, it's, you know, I I'm definitely talking to a lot of students and maybe I even know some of them, but overall there's kind of like, a lot of them are anonymous to me. Um, right now you're kind of anonymous to me too. And I don't know how many people could even be watching. So, but I'll get there in a second. It's complicated, but back to, so mass is big. It's like to some sort of like unknown audience. And there could be lots of goals associated with those messages. Whereas interpersonal is much more personal. If I'm talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'm really trying to tailor some sort of communication to them. Maybe I'm trying to become friends with somebody. So I'm trying to make them like me or something. It's much more personal. And usually interpersonal communication is not mediated and mass communication is mediated. So normally when people say mass communication, they're thinking media. And normally when they're saying interpersonal, they're thinking non-media. But haha, let us let us um scramble that a little. Oh, and this is just me. I was just pointing out like normally even like in college, like we have a class for interpersonal communication and mass communication, but never combined, right? It's like, these are two separate things. Um, but are they? Um, this is how, yeah, this is how professors act like, ooh, ta-da, you know, um, but really it's kind of obvious. I know. Uh, but I still want you to think about it some. Um, so there's this whole idea of, of, mass personal media like maybe we shouldn't make this distinction between well this is interpersonal and this is mass because a lot of time especially in our new media environment these things um these things overlap and um some people have argued that actually it, it's better instead of just saying is it mass or is it media or sorry is it mass or is it interpersonal to actually ask where the communication falls on two different sort of quadrants here or um 
uh, uh, well, I mean, you can see the chart here. It, it, you could literally actually graph this, but don't worry, we're not doing math or numbers or anything like that. Um, basically looking at how, okay, remember we talked about interpersonal communication tends to be very personal or mass tends to be very impersonal, but there's a continuum to draw. So sometimes it depends on how private the message is or how public the message is. It's not about how many people it's addressed to. Think about when you're using a, um, a social media site like Facebook. I know your parents use Facebook. You don't use Facebook. Okay, I get it. Uh, but the reason I like Facebook as an example is because that platform has a lot of different ways to communicate with people um, or Twitter or um, like where you've got private channels that are very private and therefore you can engage in interpersonal communication that's mediated only to like one person, but like through these like private um, messages, text messages, things like that. Whereas when you post something to a wall or a newsfeed or something, even here's the thing, even if it's meant for only one person, all these different people see it. So it's kind of interpersonal, but it also can become mass because it's more public. So that has to do with access exclusivity. But people who study this are also like, yeah, but it has to do with um, really how personal is the message. And this doesn't just apply to media. I mean, think about it when people propose to each other on like the jumbotron at the basketball game or whatever, like, okay, that is to a mass audience, right? But it's kind of an intimate message, right? So that would be a very personal message that's in a very public space. So this is all just like, again, very long-winded way of saying it's really complicated, but you can kind of see that interpersonal and mass communication can intersect in different types of channels. Um, and the best way to conceptualize them can be like how public is the message and how access exclusivity and how personal is that message to whatever audience it's for. Okay, moving on again, really fast. How am I doing on time though? Oh my God, I don't know if I'm, okay. I'm actually not doing so bad. I'm really proud of myself. Um, okay, um, so now I wanna talk about uh, new media in particular, because like I you know, um, said, I was using a lot of new, me new media examples, but let's just talk about what that is. Um, I mentioned mass communication before we are talking about sort of these traditional forms of broadcast media. Sometimes you may have even heard with like the news legacy media, like traditional like um, legacy newspapers, New York Times, you know, a newspaper is again, mass communication because it's like one message in the paper that's broadcast to, you know, whoever the hell picks it up. Um, uh, broadcast television, um, uh, radio, like the dial radio, like on your car and stuff like that. Um, well, <laughs> actually, good. Forget I said dial. Uh, that, that's where I'm going with this. Um, new media is usually what we can, we, I think, would be synonymous with what you could call digital media. Digitization was this process that sort of allowed the distribution of con that changed the distribution of content, media content, in a lot of ways. Um, Digitization itself, and I'm not a computer scientist, nor, you know, am I in the matrix that I know of, um, but it is basically the storage of information in a type of code, binary code, zeros and ones. I have a nice little matrix illustration for you right here. Um, and when, and that makes something digital. So what does digital look like? Um, I'm actually, it's so weird that like, I'm like, this is like so random. I didn't plan this. This is a, this is a, a, a remote control for a, um, a training collar for my dog, the big one, not the, the small ones. Like if I press this button, it'll like send a noise out to sort of like, sh well, I actually, it does. I, there is a shock thing on here too, but I am hoping not to have to use the shock. It's to make it so she doesn't chase my chickens. Um, but it's got like a little, um, let me see if I can turn it on. Don't worry, it's not on her. So even if I do, but see, it's eh. this is like a digital screen, right? Um, think about the difference between an uh, like a regular clock and then a digital watch, right? Where it's easier to read time because you don't have to worry about two hands, you know, things like that. You know, what made the digital watch possible was being able to sort of store the information about time 
So it shows up in the nice screen and everything. And again, I don't know how that works, but um, that's that's the difference between a digital clock and regular clock. But think about how this affects like media too. So um, think about radio. We did, you know, like used to have like a radio that you could move on a dial from X on XM or the AM dial. You could move it all the way, you know, up the scale, but like there was only so much you could move it, right? There are only so many radio channels you could have. But if you use like a digital source, like satellite radio, where you can really have as many stations as you can have combinations of the code, ones and zeros, it, you know, permits us to have infinite possibilities of how many radio stations you can have. Um, but this is everything. I mean, this is behind our computer systems. This is behind our iPhones. This is behind everything. Um, and so one of the things that digitization changed, well, there's a few, as I just mentioned, is now all of a sudden we can have sort of infinite channels. Um, it also gives us a lot more control over the content that we do have, right? I mean, now you can like, um, pause things, you know, because it's like, well, you're kind of in control of that digital content. Well, sometimes um, it can also affect transmission. You know, we can um, watch things on demand now because we have these like digital streaming devices. Um, TiVo, um, you know, allowed us to actually be able to like have enough control over the content that we could just like pause it or fast forward through commercials. I mean, it's like not that mind blowing now, but it was a huge shift from broadcast media where we just had to sort of watch whatever was being, I can't even use the word stream, but like, you know, given to us. Um, oh, okay. I'm at 15. I'm going to try to wrap it up. Um, and um, there are some other differences right now, but psst, this isn't actually going to be so much on your quiz. So um, if you have questions, we can talk about it later. <laughs> um, this is what I want to end up with, though. Um, so the, the main characteristics of new media, like if we're sort of distinguishing new media from that old traditional media is one is interactivity. We have a lot more control. We can, we can interact with our media content in a way that we couldn't do it before. Again, I do think a, a great example of this is think about how you interact with your streaming services if hulu disney plus whatever you know whatever or even like the example before like a uh, uh, digital record digital recording devices where you can pause fast forward you can choose what you want to watch you can watch something different in the middle right we don't it doesn't matter we're not dependent on the broadcasting model anymore uh, we can get in there um, and obviously things like video games are also interactive and digital um, asynchronicity Remember in um, in this course, uh, in your syllabus, I was like, your first lesson, what's asynchronous mean? Uh, well, uh, asynchronous is also, a asynchronicity is also a feature of um, a digital media because we don't have to just watch things when they're on. We can control when we watch things. It's really, um, it, it's the on-demand feature of media. And this is all just because of, go, again, those ones and zeros. Um, and finally, demassification. Um, remember mass communication is all about just sort of appealing to everyone, sending a message out and whoever receives it, giving it to the masses. Demassification is making something more personalized. So, um, when you talk, hear terms like narrow casting or personalization, those are all things associated with demassification. Instead of appealing to everyone, we're trying to appeal specifically to either a narrow audience or maybe even a specific person. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this too. Um, we're going to um, filter bubbles is something that um, you have an option even to write about for your first uh, uh, little discussion board prompt if you want. Filter bubbles are sort of hyper-personalized search um, bubbles um, that can result perhaps, arguably, because as you're um, getting search results that are tailor-made to you, because if your search engine thinks, oh, um, Elizabeth really seems to like chickens. So the first thing I'm going to do when she does a search for um, animals is show her um, results dealing with chickens, right? Those are results that are tailored to me. But the problem is, is does that mean that other things are being filtered out that maybe I would get to see if things weren't being demassified or personalized? Um, and of course, that has a lot of implications for our political diet. Like if our search engine or our social network sites know that we have a certain political 
um, affiliation or preference? Does that mean that um, it's only going to show us things to personalize it um, that it, th it thinks that we like um, at the expense of other things. So um, there could be some problems potentially, but that's actually kind of what I want to hear about if you want to write about that with this that sort of personalization system. But um, at the same time, um, if you like chickens, it could make for a better user experience. So, um, okay, thanks. I know I talked fast and yada, 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 but uh, I don't know, because of the characteristics of new media, you can slow it down maybe and uh, whatever and of course if you want any clarifications or need any help or anything like that please don't hesitate to reach out to me okay gonna go do another video now okay bye